All right, welcome to Intro to View. All right, to get started, let's do the least exciting part of this, which is getting it installed. Um, I would like everybody to follow me. And you're going to, and you can do this from any folder, doesn't matter. npm install dash g at view slash cli. Run that command. There's a value in tradition. She didn't even know though. Oh wow, this takes so long. Oh yeah, it's big. This is uh, an equivalent to like create React app. When it shows that like progress bar, it's not even like done with one. Yeah. So some of that is that these kinds of installs are enormous, and a dozen people are all doing it at the same time on not killer Wi-Fi. All right, so I run that. But not all of them are trying to download like a gig and a half of shit at the exact same time. It's it's large, whatever it is. Oh man, there's a no percent chance it's gonna work on mine actually. I do. Uh, I was gonna demonstrate that to you, but corporate spyware still a thing. That's gonna take an hour and a half. Um, So we are going to first step npm install dash g at view slash cli. Your next step you are going to run view create. And let's make bark wire. This is not I really wish I would have gone to that front end showdown. Face off? Yeah, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. When I understood React, because I was thinking about it the other day and I was like, oh my god, it made so much sense, like retroactively looking at it. The but good news is, it was recorded. You are going to manually select features. So you create bark wire. Oh man, it's not on this one. Uh, let's see. NV node V. Okay, node. You're going to manually select, okay. and I want you to pick 
Babel. I want you to pick router. I want you to pick view X. I want you to pick CSS preprocessors. And that's it for right now. You can leave that selected if you want. It doesn't make a difference. Yes. Uh, it means you don't have it installed. All right, so we'll do this. History mode, you got it. Yep. And then you can hit enter all the way through. So uh, if you hit enter, the N is capital. That means no is the default. So just enter all the way through. Uh, what do you mean? Doesn't matter. NPM, but. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can go back to previous um, options that I have to. Uh, no. Thursday. Yeah. And I was 
So if you do those two things, they're going to end the end of solid mode. And then that's um, very true. That's true. reinstall, try that, try reinstall WCLI. Yes. These matters. Okay, to do this, then do the other one. Uh, and then NVM install node. Actually, the curl command? Hmm? The curl? Correct. Once you, uh, once you have this running, or the, once you have the install complete, then I want you to. Uh, let's do NVM install 11 actually. Hold on. Okay. Install 11? Yeah. 8080? What kind of? 8080, we call it. Is that what it always does? Yeah, it's a way more sane port to do a front end thing on than 3000. Uh, Can I try this? Uh, yes, now try to install. NPM. It is weird. All right, so once you've got that installed, go into your bark wire folder and you're going to run uh, npm run serve. That's fine. That would just be yarn, yarn serve. So yarn was an alternative to NPM that got really popular about four years ago because NPM used to suck. So yarn was made as a way faster, more predictable, everything alternative. And it was, and then immediately NPM was like, oh no, no, we won't suck anymore, we promise, and got better overnight. And then like everybody went back to using NPM and now people are starting to drift back towards yarn. But things like that lock file we get, the package.lock, that's a super useful file that, N, that yarn has always had that NPM used to not have. Um, and like, if we're doing any command other than start or test, we have to put run in front of it first. Yarn, you can just say yarn serve and it'll figure it out. It is better, but keep in mind that anytime you have something like that, that's like a little bit better. It's also probably not that sticky. And people, including myself, love sticking with like mainstream, default, whatever the fuck, uh, because NPM is probably gonna be running a lot longer than like yarn shit is. So that's always a gamble you run. Did NPM run still? Yeah. There, the, uh, that's fine. Um, yeah. The, you have them both installed. All uh, Yarn is is like some sane shit around NPM. Um, yeah, you can do it the other way. Okay. All right, so we're gonna run NPM run serve. Uh, Katie, if, if it doesn't work in this lesson, I'll sit down with you later and get it figured out. While I'm waiting for that to, uh, to launch, let's take a little tour. Some of the stuff should be very familiar. Public folder works exactly like it did in React. This is stuff that will be included basically as is um, when our app gets built. Source directory, wow, works the exact same way that it did in React. The difference is that 
we actually have um, uh, a folder structure that's kind of built out for us ahead of time. We don't have to use this. We don't have to have a components folder. We can throw everything in one uh, big bucket, kind of like uh, we do by default in React. But, oh baby, is it really nice to have this stuff uh, split out. Um, we have a main JS, does the exact same thing that index.js did in our create React app. Sort of pulls everything together and then mounts it on some element. We have an app.view that, wait for it, it's a lot like app.js was in a, a create React app. But this is where we start seeing some differences uh, in how this is structured. Key thing to know about every React or every view component got three parts to the files. We have the template. This is like what would go in the render function. We have the style. This is what would go in that CSS file that we import. And there's a script. This is where like um, our computed properties, our methods, all that kind of stuff is going to end up going. App.view doesn't have one by default. So what I want us to do is we're going to add one and we're going to export default and oh, this is beautiful. We don't have to do a function. We don't have to do a class. We're just going to export an object. And the way that uh, view works is if we follow some very light conventions, we got all the same stuff that we got in React structured in a much saner way. So some things that we may have in this object that we export. We can have data. Data is unique in that it's a function. And whatever it returns, is our state. This replaces state. Has to be a function though. Nothing else is. So if I make a key called computed, that's an object. And I could make something like count string and it might return uh, something like the count is this dot count. Dope. I could have a method. Methods be something like increment. And maybe what it does is it sets this dot count equal to this dot count plus one. There's no set state, there's no magic around it. Um, and this is like kind of the basic structure of basically any React component or any um, uh, view component. So I'm gonna delete all of that stuff in there and let's see if I can just get two curlies count string to show up. The count is one. This is the entire app right now. See if you can get this far. Um, in my editor, app.view is like white. Mm -hmm. And so, but like other ones are of color. Because these are just regular old JavaScript. There is no such thing as a dot .view extension and all these kinds of things. So you need to install syntax highlighting for view. Syntax highlighting for view. Oh, it did? I scoot closed back, but I didn't know what it was. 
Cool, give me a thumbs up if you've got a roll on you. Colin, Aaron, you doing okay? Yeah. Okay. So now let's increment that mofo. So maybe make a button component or button uh, element. All right, this is this is where we get something new. These things existed in React. Um, we would just set state equal to this object. Um, instead of this computed area, we just say count string equals bad arrow function return the thing. And it would return this dot state dot count. The increment method would do a this dot set state with like whatever this is doing. This is something a little bit different. The way that we handle events, React has gone to great pains to just kind of take events out. We do that like on click uh, kind of stuff and we have these like synthetic event handlers. The way you do it in Vue is the at symbol, uh, you listen for an event that way. So we can do something like at click equals and then whatever we pass into this, it's going to look for a method with that name, and it's going to call it whenever that happens. So if I do at click increment, I wonder what happens. Yeah, Damon. Ooh, very nice. So let's say, so Damon says, what if I want to pass something in with this? I don't have to do a bunch of higher order function gobbledygook. I can say increment, maybe I pass in amount. And I increment it by the amount. It will do the like higher order function shit for me. I can just call it like that. That is crazy, huh? All right, let's see. What else? Let's, um, Hmm. All right, let's say I want to make, just wrap all this in a component. So I'm going to put it in a div. And I'm going to call this, I don't need to do class name, I can just write regular old HTML. Uh, I'll call this incrementer. All right, now I want uh, to just throw all that into a component. You don't have to do class name. Correct. Yeah, like the HTML is just the HTML plus mm -hmm. our like view things, not instead of them. So I am going to, let's take a look at what we're working with again. Ranger. So in this source folder, the differentiate between views and components, these are the same thing. There's only one kind of component in view. It is super helpful to think of them in terms of views and components. The reason why 
is uh, routing in React is kind of a second class citizen. It's something we add into a view, uh, React app later in the process, right? And then it's just a component and it reads the URL. It's basically like a, a really fancy way to do a, a conditional rendering, right? First class citizen in Vue, a lot like it is in um, Rails. So a URL comes in to the router, a lot like we had in Rails. Router figures out where it should send that request, but we don't have controllers like we did in Vue. Instead, it routes it to a, wait for it, Vue. Figures out which component should handle that request. And within those views, we have regular old dummy components that can have their own hierarchies almost exactly like we did in React. But we differentiate a view as something that a router renders. I like to do all of my data access stuff. So this is stuff we would use Redux for in, uh, in React. All that stuff happens with views. I try to keep that stuff out of components so we keep the components as dumb as possible. Uh, and by contrast, we try to keep any kind of like logic stuff uh, out of views and put that into components. Jesse. Uh, yes. So if we go back to the app.view, where's the state in this? Data. Data. Data is state. Mm -hmm. Um. So not necessarily stateless, although that is a good ideal to shoot for. I guess what I mean is uh, in those components, I generally don't want to see fetch calls in those. I don't want to see things that have to um, integrate with other outside systems. I want to see those happen in views, or even better, I want to see that happen in a data store and have the view manage communication with that data store. And then your components, all they do is get data, get props, and send up actions. So what's the overrun around like, like view versus the component rendering HTML? They, uh, they both have to render HTML. So this is a view. Right now it's got this. But I can pull in components and render those in here, and I'm going to do that in a sec. It looks just like it does in React. So if I want to make that incrementer component, I'm going to put it in the source components directory. So I'll touch source components. I'll do incrementer dot view, not dot js, dot view. But view is what lets us do all that magic shit where we have a template and a script and a style in the same file. It's called a single file component. You will make a mistake at some point where you make one of these JS and uh, Webpack will blow up. All right, so I've got this incrementer component. And what I want you to do is inside of the incrementer component, make a template. Make a script and make a style. Are styles scoped in view? They can be. So if you do scoped like that, these styles will only apply to this template and any components inside of it. So it just keeps them from leaking out. I actually don't like this. Um, it doesn't work with any dynamic elements. 
which won't bite you right up until it does. One of the best parts of the style tag in a uh, view component though, lang equals scss, and now we can use sass. That is sick. Cool. You can. So as a sidebar, let's take a look at develop Denver. Oh, that's going to take forever to load. I'll come back to that. But yeah, I'll show you how I use separate CSS files and these single file uh, styles. But you can. All right. So this is our app uh, dot view. What we're going to do is we're going to copy this div over to the template for incrementer. So that comes out, goes in here. And now we're going to import that component. Let's say import incrementer from, and this is a awesome thing that you can use all, all throughout view. We don't have to manage um, the folder hierarchy quite as much because we get a little shortcut. If you type an at symbol in here, it's a shortcut for the source folder. So you can just do whatever from there. From at slash components slash incrementer. And you can do that from any folder, any directory, and it'll just swap out at for wherever the source directory is. Beautiful. All right, and then to be able to use the incrementer, this is an extra step from React. We have a components object that we need to bring it in. This is a shorthand. What's it shorthand for? This is just regular gerbil script. Yep. Yep, exactly. That's just that. Which also, if you're following along, means I can rename it. But if I'm just calling it the same thing, I can use that. Those, those are fine in JavaScript. Then I can do that to use it in my template. Absolutely. So I don't have anything in my script yet, anything in my style, I just copied over the template. And the last thing I need to make this work is I'm going to copy over this export default thing. That whole object, I'm just going to copy it from app to incrementer. And I'm going to delete data, computed, and methods out of app. Because now they're just they're being handled by incrementer. I don't need that. So from app, I deleted, I deleted everything except importing this incrementer, declaring it as a component, and including it in. Step one. That stuff all moved over to incrementer. Templates there, the states there, the uh, computer property is there, the methods there. If I did all that right, it should still work. Dope. So now I've got a component. It's all handled by this. I'm exporting the entire object there. But yeah, I don't need to manually render things. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So even with the little bit that we've done, tell me how this philosophically feels different from React. Like compare and contrast it with the kind of stuff that we did in Rails, where everything was magical. What feels same, what feels different? How does it feel same or different than React? Yeah, Andrew. Um, it definitely feels similar with the whole, I guess, kind of component thing, even though these are like, I guess these are components from mm -hmm. views. And the, the thing that feels really different though is like the fact that they each have like their own sort of state and like their their um, methods are all kind of organized in their own file as well as mm -hmm. like styles, of course. And it just feels really flexible with like how you can go about doing that. So, a thing that's true out of what Andrew said is that how it's organized is very different. React does not make any presumptions about how you organize stuff. Not in folders, not how you name stuff. The state word is important. The render word is important, as is like all the lifecycle methods. Past that, it's just JavaScript. You have to call that hash computed. You have to call that hash data, and it needs to be a function. You have to call that hash method. And the this keyword in there has zero relationship with how it works in regular JavaScript. It's magic view stuff. It's always pointing at the thing you're expecting to point it at, which is probably the most different from JavaScript as it could be. What exactly? So this is declaring things that you want to be available in your template, uh, like this, that are derived from state, but aren't themselves state. Like putting this inside of data, that'd be ridiculous. It's not separate state. It's something that is built out of existing state. Great question. We're gonna find out in a sec. Other questions so far? Let's stick with um, what's the same and what's different for a sec. This is kind of getting to Jesse's question about when we would do this versus React, how we make these decisions. Other things that are same or different from React or Rails? The whole importing thing seems pretty similar to React. You guess that you import it and then call it pretty much make it available. There's a lot of similarities. So it's making us organize the code in a particular way, but we're not writing a different language here. A lot of this stuff is pretty much the same. What about Rails? What feels the same or different from Rails, especially versus React? Mm -hmm. Gives you a lot of stuff for free, has a structure, enforces a particular kind of organization. If you follow the conventions, magic happens. If you don't, woe befalls you. So if we think of every framework in every language being on a spectrum, being opinionated or unopinionated, or you can also call this configuration or convention. There's a spectrum here. So at one end of it, pretty fair to say React 100% on that side of it. You have to do everything by hand. You don't get a router for free. You have to pick which router you want and import it and then use it. You can use three different routers at the same time. Uh, you do whatever you want. 
On the front end, the super opinionated convention, follow the rules and we'll give you the, everything for free, literally built by the Rails team, is Ember. Um, That's such a good question. Reason is that the learning curve on React is you get a you can make components like right away, and then you just get this real nice learning curve while you're learning React. The stuff you're building here, a lot of it is trash. It's like just terrible ideas, but stuff shows shows up on the screen very quickly. In Ember, the learning curve is a little bit like this. Um, you have to learn everything to do anything, but once you've done that, oh baby, it's nice. Um, but people come across this, they go through the Ember guides, and they go, this is confusing, I have to learn too many words. I, I'm, not even, I, I'm just trying to make an app here, I don't understand why I need this, I don't understand why I need this, I don't understand why I need this. And so then they, now, now I'm getting something done. Problem is that like you're just wrapping rope around your neck as you're building this like app hierarchy. And the reason Ember wouldn't let you do it is because it's a bad idea. And uh, Ember doesn't let you do bad ideas. Your app won't compile if you try to make something happen that you should probably not do. It's protecting you from yourself. And in fact, it's so reliable on that that if something you're trying to do won't work in Ember, it's a sign that you don't understand the problem correctly. <laughs> It's like, so you even get a feedback loop there. I fucking love it. It is the most delightful tool to work with. And also, since every, every Ember app looks exactly the same, it's just like Rails. Same folder structure, same naming convention, same everything. Like, uh, back when I was really involved in that community, I could just jump into some rando Ember app and like start debugging immediately. I knew where everything was. And somebody could just ask you an Ember question. It's like, hey, I'm trying to do this in my app. And you go, oh, import this, call it this, done. I don't need to know anything else about your app. That's fucking cool. And since that's the case, testing in Ember, like all the built-in testing shit you get, because it doesn't have to account for a billion different ways you can configure your app. So much good stuff for free. So those are our two spectrums. I would put view about there. Right about in between. Some opinions, some conventions, but ultimately it's still just a naked component framework and you can do kind of whatever you want with it. Um, and I'd put Angular probably about right there. A little bit more opinion, but not even close to how much Ember is. Are all seven frameworks written in JavaScript? Have to be. Anybody know why? Because that's what your browser understands. Now, if something can, no, it's, it's super not. Because you can, you can use things that compile to JavaScript, like TypeScript. Modern Angular is all written in TypeScript. Um, and so that compiles to JavaScript, but it needs to get to JavaScript eventually. Yeah. Sure. Can anybody tell me what TypeScript is? Katie. Katie. What's TypeScript? Uh, it's a superset of JavaScript. Superset. That's a good vocab word. So this is JavaScript. This is the set of things that are JavaScript. A superset is Everything JavaScript is plus more. SCSS is a superset of CSS. Literally any CSS file, if you make an SCSS file, still works. You just also get all these other things. So Katie says that it is a superset of JavaScript. What do we get with it? Um, my understanding is that it allows you to very deliberate in the data types that are allowed to be passed in, which means if you get errors prior to compiling versus when um, you're running job, with actual JavaScript code, 
That is a 99% right answer. You get the errors when you compile. Um, so I say that this function takes in two arguments, and they're called this and this. That's all I can do in JavaScript. In TypeScript, I can say this thing takes two arguments. They're called this and this. The first one needs to be a number. The second one needs to be a string. And if there's anything in your code that could pass in something that isn't those, it throws an error when you are trying to let, as you're writing it. They go, ah, 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 made a mistake over here. So you find that out as you're writing it, not when your user gets a mysterious error and you can't figure out why the thing isn't working. Compile time error, runtime error. Compile time errors are a lot easier to work with. So how come everybody doesn't do it? What's the trade-off? It's picky. Speed. Speed. Also exhausting. Just declaring types for fucking everything. And we run into one of these kinds of things. It's very hard to do a little bit of typing in your app and also it doesn't provide that much value unless you're using it with everything. And the place that I always like table flip uh, when I'm working with TypeScript, a lot of people do, is you also need to type things like your API responses, including like not your API. Yoikes. Which means you need to like write out all the rules for all of that. Some of that is like just out there and you can use, but or if you're using a third party library like Lodash, also need to type that. Now, Lodash has type definitions that you can use, but um, that's part of the trade-off with doing something like that. All right, one more thing I want to show you with, um, with Vue. Somebody asked about props. So let's say this thing can't own the count. Count needs to get used in a couple different places. So what we would do, same thing as React. We find the nearest common ancestor. That state has to live there. And we pass it down as props wherever else it has to go. So we're going to move data out of incrementer back into props. Cool. Now, just like we did in React, we're going to say uh, count equals count, except this count is going to have a colon in front of it. That tells us that we want to bind whatever this is to whatever that is. So that's our state. Bind this prop to whatever this currently is. I think you said this when you were setting up, but I just think it's mm -hmm. trying to get this to work. Um, you don't have to declare whether it's a function or a class. It just it sort of knows it. Exactly. It okay. We're just exporting a regular old object. It's neither. OK, so we pass that in. Over in the incrementer component, we need to tell it that we're looking for that. So we make a props hash. And we get a little bit of light typing on this. We can say count number. And if something gets passed in that isn't a number, like a string or a function or something, it gives us a warning. It goes, ah, you said this is supposed to be a number. You realize that's not necessarily happening, right? It's handy. Poor man's TypeScript. <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> cool. So now, prop, uh, this count prop is being passed in. And we can do this.count. Everything else works the same way. Bang array. Will it break your app as a fourth member, or will it just throw a console error? It doesn't break the app. It gives you console warning. Console warning. Okay. Yeah. Now, just like we would in React though, uh-oh, I can't modify my props. I don't own them. That wouldn't make any sense. So if this is where the state lives, finish the sentence. What was that, Lizzie? It's where the method lives. It's where the method to change that state has to live also. So I'm going to move that. Over to here, womp womp. Now I don't have my increment though. 
shit. How am I going to do this? So, this is all well and good. Has that count, passes it in the incrementer, it's bound. I have the means to increment that. All right. There's two ways to handle this, the React way and the everybody else way, and Vue will let you do either one of them. What would the React way be? Guess. Pass it in as a prop. Pass it in as a prop. So I say increment is increment. Maybe put these on separate lines. All right, so I do something like that. And then over here on click, I can do increment. And I just have to declare it as a prop. And it's a function. OK, I'll bet that works. Nope. What didn't it like? Oh, I totally do. Good call. Oops, something doesn't like. Increment is not fine. Should be. Oh, do I need to alias it? I might. Oh, that's annoying. This is exactly why this shit's so stupid. Uh, this dot increment 10. Is it like that? I bet it is. Nope. Did I spell it right? There, there. Weird. So it uh, doesn't matter because don't do it that way. Um, I think it's a ridiculous thing in React. Um, I think it's a bad way to do this also. We're going to do actual actions up. We're going to do handle this the exact same way that we did with um, with the DOM. We're just going to bubble up an event because it's a DOM hierarchy, right? So if I spit out an event, somebody else should be able to listen to it and do something as, a, as an event listener. So in the uh, incrementer component, we're going to say on click, um, I want to um, increment. And then I need a method to handle that. So the on click call this method. What this method is going to do, this dot dollar sign emit and whatever event we want. It's just like a DOM event, except we can name it. So I'm going to call that uh, increment. And then instead of passing that in as a prop, I listen for it as an event. All right, that's looking for the amount to increment it by. So let's say let's omit that event and pass it 10. So it listens for that event, it calls that method, it passes over whatever arguments it got, and handles the state change. We'll see if it works. Pew, 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 pew. So let's diagram out what just happened. So I have an app component that has a state count. Inside of that, I have the incrementer. And it's got that little 
button on it, and it's got the count. So this is bound there. This button emits an event. We listen for the event, increment the count. I think that mental model is so much simpler than the React one, where we're passing down props and the means to modify those props as functions. They're both going the same direction. Data down, actions up. Actually. And if you think of this incrementer component as an element, which is how all these components, this is what, where we started with this, what if you could make custom elements? We're just listening for DOM events. And then adding event listeners that change the state. Yeah, Ben. Um, why do you need to sort of wrap this up with this thing? Um, in this? Uh, yes. So uh, they just use two instead of one. So does uh, Angular, so does Ember. This is uh, ripped off of a templating library called uh, Handlebars, which itself was ripped off of a templating library called Mustache, and they've just used two the whole time. Yeah, the things that people name things. Yeah, look, it's a little, little mustache, plus little handlebars. Um, so yeah, that was the convention in JavaScript world, and then React, in their never-ending quest for efficiency, got rid of some of them. Got rid of a pair of braces. So you always need the this one, regardless of? So what's cool about this, we get some magic. This, it'll, this refers to like basically all this shit. And it will figure out whether or not it's a prop or a computed or a method just based on how you're using it. To wit, don't use, like you shouldn't have a method named count also or a computer property named count, it, it will not work the way that you expect it to. So these things need to be named different things, but in exchange, you don't need to preface them with anything. If you have functional components, do you have particular functional components? No. Okay. All the components look like this. Okay. So dollar sign, anything with a dollar sign in front of it is um, special view magic. So. If I want to trigger an event, and just like React, all this stuff is an abstraction on top of the DOM. They're not actual DOM events. Dollar sign emit is how we make a, a fakey event that we can listen to. Okay. So you're always using that. Yep. That's how you make this element fire off a DOM event that you can listen to. Could you go through again uh, the difference between like the data methods? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we got a couple different things. This is any components I want to use in my template. I import them here. I declare and name them here so that I can use them in my template. Thing one. This state. It needs to be a function that returns an object, but past that, same as state and react. Computed is stuff that is derived from state, but isn't itself state. Mm -hmm. Methods are things that either other methods call or get called from templates in response to events usually. In the templates, binding, that's passing down as props. Listening, that's bubbling up as actions. That's another awesome thing about not treating everything as a prop. This is what comes in to the component. This is what comes out of the component. In fact, that's how I do component design. Like, all right, so here's the component. What does it need in, and what will it do, like, event out? It's just the same way you do a function. What arguments does it take in? What does it return out? In, out. Can you go over one more time how you passed that increment function? Yeah. 
I didn't. On the click event, which I listened to with at, just like I did in the other one, when a click happens, call my method increment. Correct. What this does fires off an event. I can even give it arguments if I want to. Fires off the increment event. This component listens for that event, calls its function called increment takes in that argument that I gave it, modifies the state. So when you are calling that event back in your incrementer, it has to be the same name as the one that the other one's listening for? Yes, that, so that needs to be the same. The increment has to be the same because it's, when it's passed back up, it's looking for that in app. Exactly. I can call this, I, I call this fart. <laughs> um, so it emits a fart. <laughs> I listen for your fart and increment in response. But those have to be Correct. Those are the two that are that are pairs together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I did increment like that, um, don't. Because it starts fucking with the this binding, and this isn't JavaScript this. This is magical view this. So what does it tell me to do error Who knows? This is not the thing we want. OK, I got you. This is part of our trade-off in this. Hey man, it's just JavaScript. Follows the same this rules as the rest of JavaScript. The downside is like you can't use the method shorthand. You have to keep track of the this. Over here, this means the same thing always. But you have to learn a new thing because it's not JavaScript this. It's view this. Yep. None of that. Now, you can do some of the same patterns. There's plenty of you developers who do that like compa uh, container component, presentational component thing. I don't think that's a good idea, but it's, it's allowed because it's not that conventional. If you want to do it exactly the way you do uh, React apps, you can. That's allowed. If you want to do it almost exactly like you do Ember apps, you can. You don't get any of the goodies for free, but you can structure your app that way if you want to. That's why it's kind of right in the middle. What else? Yeah. Sort of. Uh, it's closer to how it works in uh, Rails. So this is their router. Let me get rid of some of this noise. All right. Um, this is a pretty by the numbers view route. Path. This is what should show up in the URL. This is what I'm naming this. This is the component renders. What's fucking cool about this is um, I can route. I can say, I want, I want this link to route to the home route. I can do it by name, like that. And then I can make this URL whatever I want it to be. I don't have to link it to the URL. To wit. on the Develop Denver site. If I go into the app, ah, nope. If I go into the router, these are all the different pages. This is also how I take stuff off, like, we're not doing uh, talk submissions anymore, just coming out the route. <laughs> um, so these are all the pages on the site. 
when we did, all right, this is a perfect example. Conference badges. Uh, I, Michael Dusing got convinced at some point that like calling them tickets was confusing people. It was not. Uh, but he's like, well, we're not buying a ticket. We don't have tickets. You're buying a badge. That's what gets you into the show. There's a ticket. Uh, but everything we've done on the site was like slash tickets. And so all we did was change that to that. It's still called tickets internally. Huh. And so we changed it in the router. All the URLs say that now. None of the app logic had to change. Um, where's, yeah, here's another one. Here's where I did the first time. Because I'm not linking to paths, I'm linking to route names. So there's a couple like extra neat things you can do on here. Um, and you can like you can look things up like you can say that this requires off because you need to be logged in to be able to edit a talk. And then we have some other good shit down here like <laughs> that checks all those things. So um, before a route transition happens, it looks through each of these and like looks at the meta. I was like, all right, if it requires auth, then some other shit happens. But if it doesn't, then it redirects back to some other thing. But all of that logic lives here in one place. Because the components and the views for that matter don't really give a shit how they get back and forth between each other. Router, take me to the place called tickets or whatever the fuck, I don't care. This handles the logic of whether or not that's allowed to happen based on who's logged in and whatever else. View shouldn't handle that. Do you import the route somewhere in app? Uh, no, because the router owns all of those things, not the views. So all of these views get imported in, and all they do is bark up to the router, uh, take me to tickets, please. Router figures out how that happens, takes you there. The views themselves don't handle any of that logic. Um, oh, another, uh, Arena asked about separate CSS files. So here is, this is like a production view component. All right, so I have, again, try to keep as little logic in your views as possible. But it's, it's got all those things. They get imported in. They get made available. And then I have some styles for these. But, and this is the cool part, all of my sizes live in one place. All the typography, colors. I don't know why sizes in there twice. All that stuff, those live in standalone files so that when I want to use a size, like for example, baseline or small breakpoint, something like that, then all of that lives as variables here. So if I need to make the gutter bigger across the app, it's just like programming. The variables all just keep those things. My uh, breakpoints for the app declared in one place. Is that what the dollar sign is? Yeah, uh, that's a SAS thing. That's how you store variables. Or, this is even cooler, for typography. Body font, somebody needs to use the body font, at include body font, and it just gives you these two. I need to change the body font across the app. This is the one place it's defined. Or my uh, thing I'm probably the proudest of, the grid system. There's a grid that's a nine column grid that's used all over the app. Nikon grid. Anybody else wants to use that grid, include grid. It even includes when you're at the small breakpoint, collapse it down to one column. Is cool. So anything that I want to use that system, I just include that mix in. <coughs> done. SAS is like the missing piece of CSS. That's how you make 
easily maintainable, sane shit. It just adds a couple things. Indeed. So I have some view that is on the grid. And, oop, none of that. All right. Maybe over here. Include grid. Now the login page uses the grid system. And I can do things like this grid form. Every form has kind of the same look and feel. When it's on all nine columns, it starts on grid line four or something and then spans. Uh, another five grid lines, I think. So over in over in styles, yeah. Every grid form starts on four, spans three, unless it's in the small breakpoint, and then just take up the entire one column you have. Nice. Cool. Other questions? Is it easier to use TypeScript in Vue? Uh, it's not any harder. Okay. Like it, it works a lot like how we just did the lang equals scss. When you're doing that install, it tell uh, it gives you a prompt if you want to use TypeScript, and then you can just start using TypeScript. Cool. What else? Than React? Yeah. Much. I don't think it's as good as Ember, but uh, boy, what a nice modern compromise. Uh, I think it's actually easier to get started with Vue because you get a lot of nice goodies for free, but it also will let you hang yourself. <laughs> Just like any like easy learning curve thing will. It just cracks me up. Uh, cool. So I don't want to do data structures right now because uh, I've been talking for three hours straight. Uh, let's do it at uh, two o'clock. Elsewise, have a good lunch, everybody.